Good morning everybody, Pastor Drew from the Lighthouse Church. Kerry and I are praying for you, we trust and hope you're keeping safe and well. Today is the first Sunday of the month and it is our communion service, but before we uh, get there, I'd just like to um, remind everybody that we will be continuing to provide an online church service in these unprecedented and unpredictable times. We still feel the safest way forward is just to continue delivering the services online. So you can be rest assured you'll find us here each week and in between, um, and we thank you for joining us. Today we have Pastor Steve bringing us a message uh, which we should all look forward to. Um, we have communion, but also there'll be a link on screen and in the description at the end of the video for the worship playlist. That will also give you an opportunity to consider your tithes and offerings as, as you honour God in those. We thank you for joining us today. Uh, let me hand you, to, hand you over to Anne and Dave um, as they lead us through communion. Hi guys, I'm here with my husband Dave. Um, some great news for you all. My husband was recently baptised and is now a fully fledged member of God's kingdom. So this is his first time in taking communion. He doesn't like talking on the phones, so you've only got my voice to listen to. <laughs> so, come to the table of Jesus, our Redeemer. Jesus invites you here as part of the people of God. Come to the table humbly, not because you've earned a place here, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love God and want to love God more. Come because Jesus first loved us and gave himself for us. Come because you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come because you want to experience the mystery of God's grace. I'm going to read from the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 26, starting at verse 17. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after the other, surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now we're going to take communion now. Um, if we can have the bread first. So as Jesus, as Jesus taught us, he said, this is my body. Take it in remembrance of me. And then Jesus took the wine and he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray. 
God our creator, thank you for the gift of your son Jesus Christ, whose love pursues us our whole life long. Thank you Jesus for giving your life to us in word and deed, even unto death, even death on the cross. Come Holy Spirit, feed us with your love that we may be filled with power to love God with all our hearts, souls and minds. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much, um, Anne and Dave. It's great that we could take this opportunity today just to take communion together. Um, now I'm just going to introduce Pastor Steve Upple to you. He is obviously um, leader of the All Nations Movement, whom we're a part of, and we look forward to hearing what he has brought to us today from the Lord. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome to all of our All Nations family. We continue to grow, there's more locations, and I'm very excited to be able to speak to you this morning uh, as a whole family, that we're all hearing the same message and we're hearing the same heartbeat, I believe, of the Heavenly Father for us. And just before I get into what I'm gonna share with you, uh, I want you to know that as a leadership team and as campus leaders, we're very aware that all of us and all of you face many challenges. Some of us are believing God for breakthrough in our marriages. Some are believing to get married. Some are believing for God to answer prayers for their children or wanting to have children. Maybe in employment or business. There may be a whole host of very real and sometimes very painful challenges that we're all working through. So I want you to know that as campus leaders, myself and Esther, and pastoral teams, our desire is to help you as a church family to make sure that our lives are orientated around a, a, a way that glorifies God, that is positioned towards Jesus, wanting to honor him, wanting to please him, and yet facing very real everyday issues that we all go through, that we all have to uh, work out what does God's word say how do I handle this and what should I do who do I talk to about this how do I pray about this so you are in our prayers and we are believing for the fullness of God's will to be made manifest in your life uh, what I want to speak to you about today is extremely close and dear to my heart, especially over the last maybe eight weeks or so. It's been a personal provocation from the Holy Spirit to see some things changed in my life according to this subject. I want to speak to you about the power of, here it is, the power of God's Word, the Bible. This book uh, is powerful and it has the ability, the potential to change and transform and enrich our lives. And so I want to speak to you about that. Just uh, very recently, I was in another country and I was with Christians who have been through some major persecution. And one of them uh, had spent uh, much time in jail, even in solitary confinement because of his faith in Jesus. And two things that he shared with me that really spoke to me in a deep way. One, that when they used to get Bibles as believers in their country that was close to the gospel, they'd get a New Testament, they'd open it up, and they'd, they'd go through and rip out the book of John and give it to one of the believers, go a little bit further and rip out the gospel of Luke and give it to another believer, uh, rip out Mark and, and so on. And then they would say, read these, memorize these, and then in the next week or two, we will switch the portions of scripture that we have so that we can share in and learn uh, the parts that we don't have access to. I, I was so provoked that there was such a commitment to God's word a love for God's word and a desire to have it in their hearts that they would devour it in such a, uh, a, a precious, precious way. It challenged me about how I handled the word. And then the second thing this Christian told me, he'd been in prison uh, for five years, uh, one of them in solitary confinement, and he said to me, 
when he came out and while he was in prison, when he's in prison, his heart was, I wish I'd spent more time memorizing God's word. Now, he already had, but he, he, he was wishing, I'd, I wish I'd hidden more of it in my heart so I could pull it up and it would be food and encouragement and comfort and strength and vision for me while I'm here in prison. So when he did get out, he said in that next year, he devoured the Bible and memorized more portions of it than he ever had before. And so I, in that conversation and following that conversation, have been very provoked myself to have a fresh and renewed commitment to God's word. Uh, this isn't just any other book. Now, it outsells every other book. I'm told that more than 44 million copies are sold every single week. And if publishers and book lists put it in their top 10, it would easily beat every single book every single week because of how much uh, copies of the Bible are out there. Uh, and they tell me that other works like Homer or Shakespeare are translated into maybe 40 language, uh, languages. I think Homer's translated into Shakespeare into 60. And yet the Bible into more than 2,000 different languages, more than 10 times what any other book has been uh, translated into. And I, I believe it's not because it's a literary masterpiece, which I think it is, poetry and wisdom and storytelling, and the lives and biographies of many great men, men and women of God, but actually it's because it's the Word of God and because it has life is that it is so desirable to people that they want it. And they know that it feeds them and shapes them and directs them in their lives. And so uh, here in the West, uh, for us as an All Nations family, may the Holy Spirit give us a fresh and renewed commitment to God's Word, the Holy Bible, the Scriptures. Let me give you a little introduction on this. I want to do this by reading to you from Psalm 119. It's a great little passage. Uh, verses 7 to 14, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Listen to all of the things. This is what it is. This is what it does. Verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving uh, light to the eyes. Let me read that one more time. Verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart, and the commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever, and the decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. Verse 10, uh, they are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb, and by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. And David goes on to say, how can anybody know their hidden ways, their secret sins? It's the word of God that keeps us from both willful sins and the sins of omission, the things that we don't know that are wrong. When we read the word, we know what's right and what's wrong. And in verse 14, he says, may these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's the preciousness the life of, the value of the Word of God, making one rich, giving light to the eyes, being a sweetness to the soul. Uh, when our Queen, Queen Elizabeth, uh, in a coronation, part of the ceremony, she was handed a Bible, and as she was handed the Bible, she was told these words, we present you with this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. Is that true? That this could be the most valuable thing that this world affords? I believe it is. I think it's more precious than any earthly possession. The Word of God, the thoughts of God, revealing the character of God, revealing the nature of God, revealing the ways of God. In it we find Him and in it we find our stories and what he thinks about us and how he comes close to us. I think that's powerful. I'm going to make a few statements to you about the Word of God, and then I'm going to finish up with a little bit of application. Here's my statements. Number one, the Bible is God's Word. It's, it's God's Word. Uh, in 
2 Peter 1, 21, it says, For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This written word, it didn't have its origin in human thoughts and human ideas, but instead those writers, 40 writers over 1600 years, shepherds, poets, kings, warriors, uh, fishermen, I mean, you can go on and on, 40 different authors putting together these 66 books in our Bible. And the Bible tells us that all of them were carried along by the Holy Spirit, that this is God's word. It's not coming out of human thought or human ingenuity. God used humans, but his spirit would come on them and they would write in the power of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Timothy, in the New Testament, uh, verse three, six, chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, Paul tells Timothy, reminds him about God's word, and he says, Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed. It's God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be fully equipped, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So as I read this, as I open it on a morning or during the day, I realize that this is God's word. He breathed it into being. And I have this Bible in my hand today. And I have a number of Bibles all around me here. Um, but I, I want to be like these believers I was with, that the value of God's word to me is more precious than any earthly possession. Why? Because it is God's word and not somebody else's idea. Uh, let me give you my second uh, point that I want to make. And there's many of these. I can only give you a handful. Secondly, the Bible is a doorway to the promises of God. Think of all the rich, wonderful promises of God. Well, this book, the Bible, is the doorway into the promises of God. Which means if I don't pick it up, if I don't give myself to it, I don't walk through the doorway to discover the riches, the inheritance, the promises, all the good things that the Heavenly Father has for me. I have to walk through the doorway. This is the doorway to all of the promises of God. Second Peter 1 and verse 4, it says, Through these He has given to us His very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. There's a divine nature. There are very great and precious promises but it's the word of God that opens up our understanding and shows us every good thing that God has. I think it's in Hosea chapter four and verse six. The Lord said this, he says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They don't have knowledge of what's available and because of it, they're destroyed. How many times have we missed out on a blessing because we didn't know the blessing was there? Uh, they tell me that there's something like two billion pounds in UK banks unclaimed, I think I read it in an article, uh, of unclaimed accounts or wills, people who open an account, save some money, and then somewhere along the way have forgotten that they had an account. Lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, not being aware, and they're missing out on rich, richness, riches and inheritances that are theirs. Now that's material. I think God's promises are worth far more David says that they're worth more than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. But if you don't know what's yours and what's available, you will still miss out. I encourage you, walk through the doorway of God's word and start to see the great and precious promises available for you, available for me, available for your family. Thirdly, I would say that the Bible is the primary way we receive revelation about God and his ways. Now, I cannot express highly enough that knowing God and walking with God is our greatest uh, adventure purpose in life, to know him and to walk with him. In fact, let me put it this way, our vision at All Nations is really simple. It's for all people to glorify God by knowing Christ, becoming like Christ, and making Christ known. No, for all people to glorify God 
by knowing Christ, becoming like Christ, making Christ known. Well, the primary way you're going to bring glory to God is by getting into his word and seeing who he is and enjoying him and obeying him and living your life for him. So we can't fulfill our all nations vision for everybody to glorify God by knowing Jesus Christ, by becoming like him, by making him known. We won't do that if we neglect the word of God. Uh, I mean, also, our theme for 2019 is to grow. We're really believing that God wants us to grow as a people, grow in stature, grow in maturity, grow in strength as people, uh, grow in our understanding of who he is, grow in the knowledge of his ways. Well, all of that, the primary way that we will fulfill our vision of knowing God and glorifying Him and becoming like Him and making Him known. The primary way that we'll grow in 2019 is if we take God's Word, the Bible, and we give ourselves to it. Psalm 119 verse 130 says that the unfolding of your words brings light and gives understanding to the simple. As I open this up, it gives me understanding and it opens up, brings light into dark areas dark parts of my thinking or my knowledge. There's a million books out there or more. And uh, yeah, you may read some of them, but I would say commit yourself to this book above all other books. Don't neglect this uh, for other reasons and other books and entertainment, but give yourself to God's word and you will grow in the knowledge of God and you will grow in the knowledge of God's ways. And I don't think anything can transform us like knowing God, knowing his ways, and having them written on our hearts and shaping the way that we make our choices every single day. Martin Luther, 500 years ago, he said, the Bible is alive, it speaks to me, it has feet, it runs after me, it has hands, it lays a hold of me. Do you know the power of God's word to do that? Number four, the Bible is your daily bread. We all need food every day to survive. And it was interesting when Jesus was being tempted by the devil. He's in the middle of a fast and the devil is saying, I can turn these, you can turn these stones into bread. Just do it and you can eat it. Break your fast, break your commitment. The Holy Spirit had led Jesus into the wilderness to fast, to pray. And the devil was playing on his appetite saying, don't, don't, don't carry on praying and fasting. Just turn this into bread and have a meal. Um, and Jesus had these great words to him. He said in Matthew 4, 4, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We've already said this is God breathed. You don't just need natural food to survive every day. You need spiritual food to survive. I think if our eyes could be open for a moment spiritually, and um, we could not only see in the natural, but we could see in the spirit, so all of the people sitting around you right now, me included, that you're looking at, you can see what I'm wearing and you can see the shape of my body and you can see whether I'm healthy or not healthy. Well, what if we could look in the spirit right now and have a look at your spirit man, the inner man, the inner being, the, the real you on the inside. If we could see that, is that person on the inside well nourished, strong? Have you been intaking the word of God, which is your daily bread, feeding or are you, are you diminished on the inside, withered on the inside, weak on the inside? If the word of God is our daily bread, then we need to eat our daily bread to become strong and to become nourished spiritually. If we neglect it, we neglect our own health. Rick Warren, a famous pastor from America, he wrote this as a quote. He said, reading the Bible generates life. It produces change. It heals hurts. It builds character. It transforms circumstances. It imparts joy. It overcomes adversity. It defeats temptation. It infuses hope. It releases power. It cleanses the mind and it's spiritual food. I'm like, give me some of that. And the truth is I have it. It's in my hand, but staying in my hand, or sitting on a bookshelf won't do me good. I'm actually going to come to a place where I'm saying, I'm going to make a commitment to feed on this book every single day so that I can become strong and well-nourished. 
Fifthly, now coming to a close here, just maybe two more after this, and then we'll pull it to a close. Fifthly, the Bible is the seed. It's the seed of God. The Greek word is sperma. I won't explain that, but you get it. It's the seed, the Greek word sperma. In other words, when it's implanted, it has the potential, if nurtured and nourished, it grows. If watered, it becomes a plant. It grows inside of us. So when I get up and I open up this scripture and I begin to read and open up God's word, the seed of God's word comes into my heart. It's implanted and it's an eternal seed. It's a powerful seed. It's a living word. We know that natural seeds are powerful. There have been seeds taken from some of the pyramids in Egypt that are thousands of years old, and those seeds were planted, and the seeds grew, and it like surprised everybody. Seeds, thousands of years old, still carried their potential to grow when implanted in the soil, watered by water, the sun shines on them, and they shoot up. Well, this is God's incorruptible seed, powerful word of God. Jesus told a parable in Mark chapter 4, Verse 26 onwards, he said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, it put, he puts in the sickle because harvest has come. It will grow, put it in good soil, water it, it will produce fruit. Must be planted, must be watered, must be nurtured. E.W. Kenyon said, our attitude to God's word determines the place that God holds in our daily life. That's powerful. Our attitude to God's word determines the place that God holds in our daily lives. The word should always be the Father speaking to us. It should never be like the message from an ordinary book. It should be as real to you as though the master stood in the room and spoke to you personally. That's what it is. God is there. I, I always imagine this as I begin to read the Bible, that I am reading the Bible by the help of the Holy Spirit, that he's there in me, with me, around me. And I say, Holy Spirit, open up these words to me. Give me understanding today. And he is so good that he does those things. Sixthly, the word will wash you. We all need a wash every day. Uh, get in the shower, clean up, get ready for a new day. Sometimes at the end of a day, if it's been a busy day and you've been out and about moving a lot or working in a heavy job or you feel sweaty, just get in the shower, clean up. Well, the word of God in Ephesians 5, 26 says to make her holy, cleansing her, talking about the church, he makes the church holy, cleansing her by the washing of God's word. That's Ephesians 5, 26. Washing us with God's word. I have found so many times that as I open up the Bible and I begin to read, especially when I read great chunks at a time, that all of a sudden it's like I've been washed, cleansed. It's refreshing. It's energizing. It kind of totally sets me free. And it feels like I've had a good wash in God's word. And my mind, my attitude, my emotions all feel like they've been renewed and set free by God's word. So I want to encourage you. If you need a good wash on the inside, if your mind needs a good wash, if your emotions need settling, let the word of God become water to you. That washes over you, replenishing, washing, cleansing. I think it was D.L. Moody who said the Bible was not given to increase our knowledge only. It was given to change our lives. That's what happens when we get washed in God's word. Seventhly, the word will give you courage. Courage comes by this book. In Joshua 1, there's a whole passage of the Lord giving a charge to Joshua. Be courageous, be strong. Moses is dead. You're going to leave these people. And then he says to him, verses 7 and 8, not to allow this book to depart from him, but meditate on it, think about it, live in the book of the law. And he said, and then you'll be courageous. You won't be discouraged, but you will be strong and very courageous. Why? When? When you live in the word of God. Living in the word imparts courage. Have you ever felt your courage failing you? If you have then I want to encourage you, if your courage has failed, then you come to a place, say, as I read the word, courage comes. I cannot tell you, and I do not exaggerate, how many times I've woken on a morning and I feel slightly overwhelmed by the issues of the day, things that I've got to do, 
But as I get my head into God's word and my heart before him, all of a sudden courage and hope begin to rise. My circumstances haven't changed, but I've tapped into an eternal source and an internal power of God's word inside of me. And I can face the day ahead because of the courage and the strength that comes from God's word. Let me give you the last one here. Now, I'm I'm missing out five or six, but I'll give you the last one. The word of God, number eight, is like a fire. I think it's Jeremiah 23, 29. He said, is not my word like a fire, declares the Lord, like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces. You get two for one there. It's like a fire. It's like a hammer. And the fire that energizes, cleanses, it, it fuels, it gets you going into everything God has for you. It, there, there is a cleansing aspect to fire as well, as well as a fueling aspect. There's a cleansing aspect. Uh, there's power in fire. You can take the metaphor any way you like, but God's word is likened to fire in our lives. You put it in you and the fire of God will begin to grow inside of your life. And I don't have time to tell you about the word of God uh, being a light and a path. Uh, 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 it'll be like a light on your path, Psalm 119 says. You, it shines before you, tells the way that you should go. Uh, 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 faith comes by the word of God. Peace comes by the word of God. Light comes by the word of God. Healing comes by the word of God. We don't have time for all of those and many more today. Here's my application for all of us. Very simple application. Would you make a renewed commitment to God's word today? It's a question. What place does it hold in your life? Wherever you're at, would you make a renewed and a greater commitment to God's word? Build your life on the foundation of Christ, but you meet Christ in the scriptures. You neglect that, you neglect your relationship. And you may not be able to do all of these five things, but write them down. I'll give them to you very quick. This is how we intake God's word. We read it. We study it. I, might, I should read it every day. I may study it once a week. Maybe set aside 30 minutes, 40 minutes to study a Bible character. Maybe a topic like faith or healing or praise. Or a book of the Bible. Whichever way you want to go. But you read it through. I would recommend every Christian should be reading the Bible through once a year. 15 minutes of reading a day. And you'll find that you can read it in a year. Studying it. Make a commitment. Whether it's once a week or once a month to study the Bible, then I would encourage you to memorize the Bible. It may just be one simple verse once a week. One verse that you take at the beginning of a week and say, I'm going to memorize these two sentences, one sentence or a passage. But commit to memory the Word of God. And going with memory, I would encourage you to meditate on God's Word. In other words, chew on it, regurgitate it. If I was thinking of a scripture, one of my favorite at the moment is set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated That's a great one. So I'll I'll memorize it, but I'll chew on it. What does it mean? Set my heart on things above. So meditate. And then lastly, don't neglect listening to the word of God. Sitting under preaching, listening to the word of God is powerful. Not just on podcasts and audio sermons, but actually being in a service with other believers, allowing the word of God to wash over you. So read it, uh, study it, memorize it, meditate on it, and listen to it being preached. You may just commit to one of those right now. You might commit to reading, uh, but start somewhere. You might say, you know, you've heard me say this many times if you're a part of the All Nations family. To do this, you're going to have a set time, you're going to have a set place, and you're going to have a set plan. Uh, If you don't set a time to read, it'll just be a good intention that never happens. Uh, For me, it's early in the morning. And increasingly, even throughout the day, I'll feel the Holy Spirit take me to read a little bit. But set a time. Set a place for me, it's in this room, in my front room, to be here and to sit in that armchair over there, be with the Lord. It's a set time, it's a set place, and then I have a plan. I have a Bible reading plan that I read through in the year, and I'm following that. Uh, And I want to encourage everybody can do it. Just go online, have a look at different Bible reading plans, pick one, make a commitment to it. Even though we're right now in April, it's okay to start a a plan now. You don't have to wait till January and you don't have to catch up from where you've left behind. Just start today where you're at. And I believe that God will bless you and help you. I found a very short video clip we're going to attach to this. I'd love for you to watch it. Uh, Let me pray. Then we're going to watch a short clip about the Word of God that's added into this message. 
and then your campus leads are going to come and they're going to lead you in a time of response and prayer. So Father, I thank you for the Bible, the Word of God. I thank you that it's not illegal in our country, that we have access to it uh, digitally on our phones and iPads, computers, audio versions. And we also have the Bible in written form in books, uh, in paper. I pray that as an all nations family, that you would give us a renewed commitment to God's Word. Give us a love for the Bible and Holy Spirit, teach us what it is to read with your help and to pray and read, read and pray as we do that. In the name of Jesus, amen. God wrote a book. That reality blows me away every time I stop to think about it. Pages and pages of God, his thoughts, his words, his heart, right there, just a few inches away. I can carry it with me everywhere I go, read it whenever I want. When we open the Bible, what do we see? We see God himself in this book. We meet him here or we don't meet him, not with any hope of friendship. Reading the Bible is one of the most important things we can ever do. It's more valuable than anything we own, sweeter than anything we have ever eaten. It is literally more important than breathing. But that's not always what we see and feel when we open our Bible. Our weak, tired, distracted eyes look and all we see is a lifeless, boring portrait on the wall. But it's not a portrait. It's a window. It doesn't hang lifeless in an old frame on the wall. It breaks through the wall into another world, the real world, the lasting world, the better world. And through this window shines a divine light that changes everything around us. We all know that the road to knowing God is not easy. Discipline and resolve are important, but they can carry you only so far. A few days, a week, maybe a month. For the long run, we need something stronger, more compelling than discipline and resolve. There are too many traps along the path, too many hurdles. At the root, the reason we don't read the Bible is that we don't want to read the Bible. We don't see joy, peace, and life when we see that leather binding on our shelf. We see a wall, not a window. The boring portrait not the never-ending beauty beyond. So we put it off, leave it shut, and move on. We stay in bed, and we miss the miracle. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness, loves to speak light into hearts and minds. God wrote a book, and with his book, these words in front of us, he wakens our dead, bored souls. He frees us from bondage to sin, from desires that rob us of life. He comforts the depressed, inspires the discouraged, guides the confused. He empowers us to make our lives count for his cause in the world. He satisfies us completely and forever with words, his words. So will I read my Bible tomorrow? Where else would I go? How else will I know him? 
how else will I prepare myself to enjoy him forever? Yes, I'll spend the rest of my life looking out of this window, watching, waiting for another sight of him, another miracle, another glimpse of my God. Thank you, Pastor Steve, for that uh, great message. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you again soon. Let us just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today uh, for the word that we've just heard. We thank that it was actually um, convict us and we will be able to apply it to our lives uh, in some way, shape or form. Lord Jesus, I pray that we are protected, that we are all blessed and we have a double portion of your blessing on our lives. Um, as we go forward in the rest of the week, let it be a blessing unto us all. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for joining us. We will uh, you know, keep uh, subscribed to find out what new videos are coming out. Uh, keep in touch. We have the website, uh, the Facebook page, but also the YouTube channel. It would be great for you to, um, to like and subscribe all of those so you'll know what's happening within the Lighthouse Church going forward. May God bless you and keep you. See you all again soon. Take care.